Your project is really trying to help us not just imagine, but feel it inside what our various, as you call them, probable futures are, depending on what precisely happens based on incremental increases in the overall temperature and climate of our Earth. So, and I know you've got some, if, if, it's just so people can get a visceral sense, if you want to share the screen, I mean, you've basically, with these maps that you are creating, to me, it's like a situation room. It's like, it's, it's, it's the map room, it's the situation room, it's where major decisions should and can be made. So you talk about a situation room. A situation room, I, I've never been in a formal situation room, but I can imagine there's a problem or there's an understanding that this is a place where you big, bring problems to be discussed. There were no practices, norms, or vocabulary to say, well, what are the questions we would ask of maps like this? What are the questions we would be should be concerned about? And so the early McKinsey work, for example, said, let's just figure out how many days a year it will be too hot to work outside in India. So we've zoomed in here and we're looking at India. And this is the number of days above at a slightly lower threshold, but 28 degrees C. Um, for our audience, actually, we'll we'll go back to the 0.5 degrees and we'll go over, we'll assume that most of our audience is American and uh, hope not to give people vertigo. But um, so the map here is organized that green is one to three days a year, blue is four to seven. Um, so it's a couple of days, less than a week, two, one to two weeks, two weeks to a, to a month and then more than a month. And so this is in the late 20th century, the hottest day or two in Houston. The hot, it's actually Atlanta would never be this hot. And so it's really, and, and if we zoom in, in fact, we can zoom in on Houston, say, well, how many days a year was it like this? And you click there. So on average, the three grossest days in Houston is what 28 degrees wet bulb is. So now we ask this question about India because there are hundreds of millions of people who work outdoors that is their livelihood, is working outdoors. You say, well, how many days of the year? Well, in these places here, it's it's still just a few, right? Less than pick this place here. It's uh, on average five days in a cool year, which is the 10th percentile. In a cool year, there would be no such days. And in a very warm year, there'd be 12 days. But if we see what happens and as we warm, those numbers jump. And it really is unsafe to be working in this environment, to be straining yourself in any way. And in many ways, actually, these maps are maps of kidney disease because the body is trying to work so hard to cool itself. It is processing water so quickly that actually the striations on these maps match quite well to the onset of kidney disease in places in, in around the world, actually. And so... If at two degrees C, comparing it back to when there were just five days a year on average, in the same place, in an average year, there would be 24 such days. And in a warm year, there would be 42 such days. So you got a month and a half when it's unsafe to work outside. If we go up to three degrees C, these are big numbers. This is the prime of growing season. This is going to do things not just to the human body, but to crops and other things. But now you see that all of India pretty much is lit up. Whereas back here, this was an isolated problem. And by the way, just for, because I'm, I'm sure a lot of the people watching and listening to this are, are familiar with that 1.5 degree mark. That's sort of like what we've been hearing. Maybe we can slow things down so we never get above that. But now most people realistically are saying, no, no, we're, we're already basically there and we're going beyond that. So it is important to look at two and 2.5 and three. That's exactly right. So what the way I think about this is, so if you click on the I here, it'll say, this is 1971 to 2000 is 0.5 degrees C. Passed, it says. Now, if you click on one, it's recent. One degree C we passed in about 2017. So we're now at 1.1 or so, or we were most recently. We'll see how this year turns out. 1.5, we're likely is, we say, impending. The chances of stopping before 1.5 now are effectively zero. In fact, we're likely to pass 1.5 this decade. So you say we're, is likely by 2030 and the probability of stopping below this. But the higher levels are potential levels of warming. So we do two things here, and I think they're both relevant. One is we're giving you these higher levels of warming instead of giving you dates because 
when we reach these numbers is uncertain, and if we reach these higher numbers is uncertain. That uncertainty depends on what we work, what depends on what society does. So probable futures isn't a forecasting tool, it's a scenario tool. But if we reach those numbers, the map is probably going to look that way. That's exactly right. So the way climate models work is they give you outcomes for a given atmosphere. So here's how the atmosphere, here's the composition of the atmosphere. We will, this is the models tell us what the weather will be like. Well, when we, if, if we have, so three degrees C is, uh, if we stay on the path we're on, it's uh, likely by the 2060s. If we change our path, it can happen later. If we change our path a lot, it can be avoided. And so we want these numbers to be both uh, indicators of, of a, a likely outcome, but also scenarios for us to avoid. One of the turns of phrase I really like is we need to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. I just have to tell you that when I looked through your maps, I didn't do the drop down menu on three degrees centigrade. And now, of course, I'm thinking, oh, my kids aren't going to even be that old in 2060. This could be the life I am leaving or we are leaving them. And I know you've spoken eloquently about, well, number one, about how important it is to the older people you know who are in positions of power that they be admired and respected by the younger generation. And we've got to figure out something. First of all, this hits on two things. We've never experienced this map here but I'm already getting anxiety looking at it. So I think you've succeeded <laughs> in, in making us feel a little bit what's happening here. The other thing is, you used a phrase that, that's stuck in my head since the beginning of the conversation, how starting from that story you mentioned of you, know, you and your wife in the car and different climate control zones for people you know, six inches away, you said, we, we, we're, we make the atoms dance. And in another presentation you gave, you talked about how it's not just about heat, it's about energy and infusing this closed system with so much energy makes it so much more unpredictable. So when, I'm, when I've been perusing probable futures, and of course you're doing this intentionally, it's not even just about heat, far from it. That's right. And so what you can also see here is the uncertainty. So the range gets very wide. And this is 10th percentile and 90th percentile, which means that there are actually 20% of the observations are outside of that. These aren't extremes. These are just a warm year and a cool year. And so the climate is likely to be extremely unstable, extremely inconsistent, but on average, much hotter. And if you think about what's happening in India, it is a agriculture is most people's work is agriculture. Figuring out how the agricultural patterns, the rainfall patterns, the monsoon, the melting from the mountains that irrigates much of much of uh, India, how the range of temperatures, what will grow, when it will grow, all of that just gets harder and harder and harder. And in a very stable climate, the, the farmers of India figured out over time because it was the same conditions decade after decade after decade, they figured out what to plant, when to plant it. You develop these heuristics, you develop these rules of thumb that tell you this is how the system works. But as you leave stability, you get closer and closer to saying, I don't know how this system works. I'm not going to make a commitment. And so when I've shown these maps to people in, in uh, high levels of finance, they say, oh my God, no one is going to lend or make long-term commitments to places that will be under stress. And so one of the things I'm most concerned about is that people will sort of give up on the future and in doing so deprive uh, people around the world of a chance to prepare, of a chance to avoid, because it will take capital to make the changes necessary to get off of this path that currently goes to three degrees. And so we can go back for your purposes, I'll zoom out, you can see globally, that this level of warming, this level of, of high temperature at 0.5 degrees C was pretty rare. Only Bangladesh really got like this more than a week a year. At three degrees C, it's a global phenomenon. Well, and there you can see at three degrees C, there are gonna be an awful lot of people 
trying to become nomads again and get not become nomads, find a new play, habitable place to stay. And what we now consider an immigration crisis is going to be like nothing compared to that. That's correct. And so this is an avoidable outcome. This is a preventable future. And my firm belief is that part of the reason we're not avoiding it currently, we're doing very little to avoid it, is people have an abstract notion that the future is either one that has electric cars and is basically the same, or it's some Mad Max dystopia that's very far away and there's nothing we can do about it. This is not that. This is in between. This is lots of suffering and an undermining and a weakening of civilization. And my hope is that by making this more vivid, one of the things I've talked about, uh, I've worked for many years with a psychologist on this work. And one of the things that we talk about is the difference between anxiety and fear. So there are lots of people who are anxious about climate change. And what this uh, woman I've worked with says is that anxiety is unstructured. Anxiety is a feeling that doesn't have a specific focus. You feel bad and often you'll, she says, you'll hang your anxiety on some hook, but it's something you can't quite, it's a bad feeling, but it's unconstructive. Fear is much more specific. Fear is I know what to fear. I can name it and I can start to think about how to avoid it, how to deal with it. And what I would say is there's very little fear about climate change. There's lots of anxiety. And lots of people have a low level of anxiety. And then young people, there are an increasing number of young people who have a high degree of anxiety and they're not wrong to do that. But it's rarely articulated as what will it actually be like? What are the actual consequences? And so it's called probable futures because we want people to start to think about, to populate that range. So if we go back to that temperature graph, you think about there's a fan chart or if you think about these temperatures here, there's a range of temperatures we face and we could live in this one and we could figure out how to live in that one or we could live in this one. And between it are 2.5 and two and all of those are going to be different. And if we think clearly about what it will mean, A, we should definitely, we have to prepare for 1.5, even when it's 1.5, two is a risk. And so, as a, as a precautionary measure, we should be preparing for two, but we should try to desperately avoid these higher numbers. And the hope is with the clarity about what those would be like, what it would feel like, what it would, the consequences of it would be. And so if you take the work with McKinsey that I uh, am proud to be associated with, they didn't say, well, what will happen to Indian GDP if this many people can't work outside? And the reason is nobody knows. We've never had this many people live in a very un, you know, unlivable environment. Trying to map that through to migration, political change, unrest, changes in investment, changes in individual and group behavior, to get that to a GDP number would be just folly. And so one of the things that I push against in the, in the economic discipline is this effort to turn everything into dollars, as opposed to say, well, here are big changes in the physics of the world. And we don't know yet what the what life would be like under these circumstances, but we can tell it would be very different. And it's extremely unlikely to be just marginally different from what we have now. And so portraying what I would call the unmanageable, which is three degrees or above, as a way to motivate staying under that level and and sort of, and so what, what we say about probable futures is that it's also a useful tool. I want to bring up the second reason we do this is that we'll zoom in on uh, a place in, we'll stay in India. So pick a place in India where there is a municipality and the people in this municipality need to figure out what infrastructure to build, what to fix, what to re prepare for. And so Maybe they need to build cooling centers where people can go who don't have air conditioning can take shelter. Or maybe they need to plan for the hundred year storm. So this is what was the hundred year storm. How often does this one in a hundred year storm or this 1% chance storm happen? If you go to three degrees C, what you see is there are places where maybe here, the what was a one in a hundred year storm is six times more frequent. 
And so the one in a hundred year storm goes from being every hundred years or not every hundred years, but having a 1% chance every year, which means that, okay, we can't really plan around that. That's sort of the limits of what we can plan for to, oh, this has a 15% a chance or 16% chance of happening every year. What was the one in a hundred year storm now has to be just kind of a wet year. That's a different storm sewer. That's a different irrigation system. That's a different flood preparedness. Those are different building codes. That's a different world to live in. And we want these people to be able to prepare for these worlds, or at least understand what the pathway to that is so that they're not surprised by environmental changes that are likely to come with climate change.